two things that I've learned throughout my career. One, everybody has a story to tell. And two, the best stories are true. This is the DTD Podcast. Okay, here we go. In three, two, one, and we're live. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the DTD Podcast. This week in the studio, an extraordinary individual whose life's journey transcends the boundaries of adversity, resilience, and redemption. From a turbulent past marked by brushes with the law, the U.S. Navy SEALs, and subsequent turmoil that led to a downward spiral, his story is a testament to the human spirit, capacity for transformation. After hitting rock bottom and grappling with homelessness and despair, a pivotal moment guided him across the Atlantic to the French Foreign Legion. It was here amidst discipline and self-restraint that he discovered redemption, inner peace, and the profound fortification of mind and body. My guest stands as the sole individual to have walked the path of both a United States Navy SEAL and a French Foreign Legionnaire embodying a remarkable narrative of personal evolution and triumph with a guiding mantra of training the body and mind for the divine design he inspires others to commence their journey towards realizing their dreams despite life's most formidable obstacles welcome into the studio taylor cavanaugh what's going on my friend EJ, I'm chilling like a villain, bro. Happy to be here, man. Yeah, man. I'm so happy. Last time we did this, we had a little technical problem. I had a big storm here. We got the power knocked out and it wiped out the interview. So I'm so glad that you came back to talk to me, man, because you have such a remarkable story. Now, I know we started last time one way, but I've had a bunch of listeners. They want me to ask you one question right off the bat. Are you or have you ever been CIA? It's on their mind and they want to know. No comment. No, okay. <laughs> no, I would have never made it through. I would have never made it through the, the, uh, polygraph, man. <laughs> to get in the CIA, man. Yeah. They, uh, they knew that I talked to you and they said, did you ask him? And I said, no, I didn't ask him. They said, you got to ask him. Cause that's what we think they are. Now these are, you know, Intel guys and stuff that I was talking to, but I wanted to ask that right off the bat, but let's get serious for a minute and let's talk. I want to ask you a couple words with their definitions, and I want you to tell me what they mean. Let's start with the word sacrifice. First of all, I think sacrifice is overused. I think it's a a highly overused word. True sacrifice, those dudes are in the ground, right? So I would say sacrifice is, is... giving the ultimate for some larger purpose self mastery self mastery is a constant practice you practice self mastery you never arrive at it so it's a self mastery is a journey it's not a destination it's conquering of desire conquering of the wants of the flesh for becoming that vessel, that example of the perfect being, which of course we will never arrive at, but that's why I say it's a journey. So I would say self-mastery is a constant daily practice of being your best self. Let me ask you something to that. If you could never have self-mastery, I think a lot of people don't understand why you would strive for it every day. If you know that it can never be attained, if that's a goal that can never be achieved in your life, why, why go for it all the time? Why would you try to make money if you're not going to be the richest guy in the world? Right? Well, because what's the alternative falling backward? If we're not striving forward, we're, we, it's, it's impossible to stay stagnant in nature. There's no, Nothing doesn't change. So you're either going forward or you're going backwards. So I I and most people would choose to evolve, not devolve. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that that's where a lot of people look at it. And and, and with a lot of people's goals in life, they think, well, I'll never make it to this level. So why even start at the beginning? And and I've Mm. never understood that about people. But looking at you and looking at all your videos and the things that you talk about, 
you tell them you'll never even know if you can get to that level if you never even start. And I think that's where a lot of people fail is they don't even start this journey. You're guaranteed to not get to your destination if you don't start moving, right? If you don't start walking, you're not if you don't start driving somewhere, you're not going to get there, right? You stay at your house, you're going to you're not going to get to the to the spot you're trying to go. So, you've got to, right? You the time's going to pass anyway. Like that old adage is, right? Don't worry how long it's going to take, man. If it's going to take five years, I got news for you. That five years, if you're still sitting on the couch, that five years is going to pass the same. So you might, might as well get somewhere more important and more desirable. Let's talk about the word addiction, what it means to you. Addiction's something that you need, something that you need on a daily, I would say, I don't want to get too specific on if it's daily or, or whatever, so some measurement of time that doesn't really matter. It's something that you need, right? It can be bad. It can be good, right? You can be addicted to self-development, right? I would say addiction has a negative connotation. And even in, say, say self-development, right? Say you're addicted to self-development. You could push that too far and and be so into it that your relationships are being ruined and think you know your life starts you know you you could definitely be addicted so i would say addiction has kind of a negative connotation uh, it's a lack of balance it's something that you need and i always like that answer i told you that when we've talked before that i really like that answer that it is looked at in a negative connotation but you kind of do need addiction in your life to strive for what you want because you need that quote unquote fix of what it gives you. This is going to be the last word purpose. Hmm. Purpose is the tr something greater than self. It's, it's the transcending of self, right? You can't have a purpose internal, right? A purpose is something that is up and out ideally for the greater good. Do you think you ever stop getting purpose in your life if you're not looking for it? Mm, that's a very good question, DJ. I would, I think that purpose is something that you, you do have to actively and deliberately seek out. I don't, uh, purpose isn't generally going to fall. Well, purpose can fall into somebody's lap as in it is shown to them as their purpose. But from that point on, it needs to be deliberate action taken towards it. It's, you can't keep on a daily, daily basis not trying and not being deliberate about seeking and living in your purpose. All right. With all those words and the definitions that you've given, I think that they paint kind of a trail marker for us for your life. I want to start with childhood, high school, uh, your youth. It was it was a, a, a strange way because I, I've told you this before. I felt like there was such a dichotomy. You had such focus to do certain things. But I feel like every time, and I've told you this, I feel like every time you got to where things were good, something messed it up. So let's talk about your youth, family life, uh, and how you kind of came to this goal of service for your life. I have military family. My father was a Marine, not a career guy. But he was a Marine. I lived on a Marine base for my very, very early, early years. And my mother's father was a captain in the Navy, Naval Academy graduate. You know, she's an officer's daughter, lived all over the world, things like that. So I, I, there was always a military pride, right? There was always a love your country. There was always that, a way, that type of energy. But it wasn't pushed on me by any stretch. It wasn't you're going in the military. That was not the, that was not the mantra. It was, you know, I had a lot of freedom of movement regarding my, what I wanted to do. But as with a lot of special operators and special force guys, some seed is planted early on. And I saw SEALs, well, I know now we're SQT students, but guys training in the San Diego Bay with my dad. And he told me what they were doing. And from that moment on, I was very aware that it was something that I wanted to do. That commando deal was once I found out that those were got, that was a real person and you could do a job like that it was interesting. You know, I was, it was the early nineties. So there was a lot of that jungle predator, you know, all that stuff was around and 
but I didn't have a romantic notion of warfare. It, what, it was a deeper seated thing. I wanted to be there in that. I wasn't seeking to be Rambo. That wasn't ever something that was on my radar. It was, I understood the, the deliberate slow approach. That's what called me like those slow patrols through the jungle. That's what called to me. And I just did a lot of research, you know, men with green faces, you know, trying to get every book I could. And from a very young age, so that seed was planted. And as I got older, I think with a lot of guys can understand who are watching this, I got sidetracked with chicks and partying and drinking and sports. And, and I knew I was going to college. It was just what was happening. Even Iraq war was kicking off at the time. It was 03. I didn't even see that as an option yet. My mother, my family would have been more, not my dad, my, my family had a tumultuous relationship. He was out of the picture in and out kind of for you know, with some drugs and alcohol problem, but still, still around, not gone. I don't want to say, want to say that, but I was supposed to go to college. My mother, it was just, and where I grew up, it was just an extension of high school. It was, I didn't know one person that didn't go to college. It was like that. So I just looked at it as mandatory extension. So I was like, okay, got put on the back burner. And through this time, I get kicked out of high school, lose some scholarships, get kicked out of multiple colleges, start dealing drugs, start doing all that stuff, getting in car accidents and bad car accidents, multiple, fly, ejected out of vehicles on freeways, that type of thing. And I, still walking, still not broken completely, kicked out of more schools. And by the time I kind of skidded into my aunt and uncles in Boston, I was living in the basement of their house and kind of reset working landscaping jobs and going to junior college, get transferred back to California where I continue on and end up graduating from university of California, Santa Cruz with a politics degree barely. And during that time I get arrested about eight or nine more times. So all through this time, I probably have been arrested 15 times with multiple, no felonies, but a lot of misdemeanors, drug charges, all of them dropped, no convictions, mind you on the drug charges, but it was like marijuana and drunk in public, small stuff, but a lot of them, a lot. <laughs> and so by the time I graduated college, I was on probation with pending court cases. And I was so unaware and so immature. I lacked self-awareness on such a massive scale. I wasn't, didn't really understand the administrative mountain I was building for myself because when I walked into the recruiter and they were like, bro, you're on fucking probation, man. We can't have you in here, dude. I realized what I had created for myself and then started to go down the road of clearing that up. I want to ask you something. You mentioned about your dad that, that he was kind of in and out of your life. There was drugs and alcohol. You started with drugs pretty young. We've talked about you being in high school. You have football practice. You guys go to Mexico. You get drugs. You, you dealt drugs. Do you think with that not in your life, without your dad having that kind of stuff, do you think you would have gone down that road if it would have been okay with your mom and him or maybe – a more structured environment with him. Do you think you would have gone down that road still? No, a disciplined household. You had a dad in the house. He's going to set the tone. The statistics speak for themselves, right? The, the amount of guys in prison with, you know, single mother households, it's astronomical. And that's not a coincidence. And I was falling down that statistical road. Your mom just can't control you the same. Right. She, she can't physically control you. And, and you know, she wasn't financially controlling me because I was doing my own thing. So it was, you know, not that I was some terrible kid. I was still on honor student to getting good grades and stuff. I was an academic all American still doing all that shit. So I had a little leeway and I was still playing sports and doing really well. So there was she I can't, you know, come back late partying and stuff. I just did. The, the discipline was definitely lacking and it was not really her fault because there wasn't really much she could do. She tried, but mother can only do so much. Were you ever mad at your dad for not being around or coming back and forth in your life like that? I would get mad when he would come back and try to tell me what to do. 
right? Just kind of like some punk kid, like, man, who, who the fuck are you coming back in here? You've been gone, right? So we'd get in our altercations, physical altercations for that. And my dad's a big dude, so it's no joke, bigger than me. And and so we, we got in our, our fair share of shit. And so I, there was definitely some teenage anger, right? I, but to be quite honest, when my parents got divorced, I was so happy. I was, I remember thanking my mom. I remember when they told me they were divorcing, I felt a joy in my heart because it was so tumultuous and tense and fucking explosive. The fights and the shit I saw growing up, I hated it. I grew up with a pit in my stomach a lot with the tense, well, the tension you could cut with a knife after some of the fights and shit and broken doors and shit like that. So I just, I was actually happy. It was peaceful. What's your outlook on marriage and relationships? Seeing that growing up at such a young age, how do you look at relationships there? I've never been married, right? I live with my girlfriend now. She's fan We have a fantastic relationship. So, uh, I learned a lot what not to do and I'm a different entity than my dad is, right? I have a, I'd say I got a little bit more of my mom in me and that I'm a little bit more calm and even keel emotionally, you know, and, and just being clear headed and aligned and having good daily disciplines. I would, I was not always that mind you, right? I was exactly like my dad after I got kicked out of the SEAL teams. Exactly. Like I couldn't even see it. I was, but I was the same guy because I was on drugs <laughs> and I was emotionally explosive. I had no emotional control, no emotional maturity at all. I was violent with people in my life. I was, I was exactly that. So, and looking back, I was, I couldn't have, I couldn't have been walking in the same steps more. As you look back on it and you realize those things now that you're older, hindsight's twenty twenty. do you apologize to those people? Do you just wipe it as part of your past? Like, what do you do when you start realizing like, hey, I probably wasn't the best guy back then? I uh, apologize to people who were in my life at that time. Yes, I have. So is it where they're like, oh, yeah, man, I'm so glad you said that. Or do you have some people that are like, you know what? Fuck you. I don't care if you're apologizing. Never had anybody say that. Really? Nope. So do you think that they understood that it came from a place? Because, you know, you and I have talked before, and when you hit that rock bottom and stuff, you really did take a deep introspection of yourself. Do you think that they could see that when you talk to them about it? Uh, I don't know if they could. I think they could just feel it, right? Because it's just how, how I was speaking to them. So... But I, I went through down the list, and it wasn't some crazy long. It wasn't like I had of done course. some terrible. But I, I had been a, a fucking asshole and immature and violent with some people, right? And so I had to, I had to come as humble as a human being could possibly say and say, hey, you know, this is. I don't really expect you to forgive me, but I'm. I apologize for being that way, and. You know, it was, it's a healing process. It's not fun, but it's necessary. Do you think when you were in high school and all of these things are coming at you, you know, you got rugby scholarships, uh, you're playing multiple sports, you're an academic all American. And then when that gets taken away, do you ever take a pause right then? I know you're pretty young and, and it's hard to say that when you're immature as a kid, but do you ever pause and go, shit, I just fucked that away. I know you did as you were going into the Navy, but at that point, did you ever think that? Not even one second. I just went, well, that sucks. I couldn't see the long-term effect of it at the time. I could only realize, okay, this happened and now I'm here. Oh, I'm not playing this year. Oh, I wasn't Oh, and now I'm not getting all the, oh, that's where those scholars, oh, why did those coaches stop calling? I didn't even, wasn't even connecting those dots. I wasn't even thinking that way. So oblivious, really. Some people are old souls. I'm a very young soul. I had no idea what the fuck was going on. When you look back on it now, 
is there anything that you would have changed about that? You know, there's that old, that old saying, you know, I don't, because I'm sitting here, you know, there's part of that, obviously, you know, but if I would go back and man, I, I sure, I think it would be interesting if I would have gone to an Ivy league school playing lacrosse, like I could have, right. <laughs> what would have happened? <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, I definitely would have, I would definitely wouldn't have lived the, the interesting life and wouldn't have as many tattoos probably, <laughs> but I would have had a much different life and would it have been better? I don't know. You know, but me, but there is no what if, right? There's just what is. And that's the reality we have to sit with. And I had to come to terms with that. There was times where I was, people say I have no regret. No, you have I, no regrets. No regrets? Really? Fucking, I got a ton of them. Right? People say that, that shit. Man, I got a ton of regrets. I got a ton of regrets of things that I wish I would have done better. Most of it was being selfish. Most of my regrets come from when I just was thinking of myself and then how, how it wasn't affecting other people. And yeah, it, the, the life would have been a lot smoother for sure. If I would have been more disciplined and just kind of locked it, locked it on. And yeah, there was times, especially at the lower moments, right. When I was living in my aunt and uncle's basement with re like really re realizing I hadn't even, I was two years into college, hadn't done anything. And was you know completely isolated and was big, big man on campus and now i'm living in the basement with doing you know doing landscaping during the winter you know it was like i was that was the moment where i went man what if i would have just not gotten you know there's definitely at the lower lower vibrational moments i had my my moments where i regretted stuff and wondered what if and there is the dichotomy to me you bring up being in boston being big man on campus and then living in the basement and everything in your life, whenever you're at those moments, when you're living in the basement, that's when you get your shit straight. That's when you start flying the way you're supposed to. You get everything in order. And then you get yeah. back out and you do something. You go back to California. We'll use that for an example. And you just yeah. start doing the same stuff over and over again. And I wonder yeah. how you get that right in your head now because – that's when you were, I won't say your best when you're living in the basement, but you're definitely the most humble and the, I, I don't even know, would you say the hardest working at that time because you know everything that you have to do? Yeah, I was pretty locked on because I knew I had a lot to do, right? I was up at four, I was working and working in a fish market, doing landscaping in school all day, transiting to Boston and do, training Muay Thai at night in the hood. I was coming, it was a, hard time and taking a long a lot heavy course load to catch up yeah i was i had to, I, it was like when your window narrows your focus has to so that's that have, that's been the moments in my life where i'm like realizing my window is very narrowed i better start focusing through this turn right <laughs> or else i'm gonna go off into the trees and, and that's the interesting thing to me you go back to california and you start to slide back into that old Taylor. So can we talk about like what the mind state is? Like, I, I understand that you're saying when the window gets small, that's when you get ultra focused in, but you just had that happen. And when you go back to California, it's almost like it never happened in your brain. It's because the situation's different. If I can reflect back, it's because I'm like, well, I'm not selling drugs now. Right. And also I didn't have the, I didn't understand how normal people lived yet, right? I've always been a guy that a lot of stuff comes to me, girls, parties, people, like just a lot comes at my, my way. And I wasn't strong enough and disciplined enough to say no to stuff. I didn't know, understand that you said no. I didn't understand when people come knock, girls come knocking at your door at midnight every night to come hang out and drink that I should say, no, go away. I have to study. I didn't really get that. And a lot of guys aren't getting that. So it was, they, they're not experiencing that. So I, I was, I was having a hard time managing the distractions at 20, 21. I just couldn't do it. I didn't have the discipline. I didn't have the long vision. I didn't have uh, any type of I knew I wasn't trying to see. And honestly, I knew I was going in the military. So I was like, man, I just got to get through this shit. 
I wasn't trying to get a job. I wasn't trying to get an internship. So I was just like, man, I got to just get through this and might as well have a good time while I'm doing it. And it was like, well, now I'm not dealing drugs, so I'm good. You know, I could, it was that justification, that bullshit lying to ourselves in some way. And I didn't see it as bad, right? I, I couldn't connect the dots of why things had happened before, right? I, I just, that synapse, that's when synapse was not firing or something, I couldn't, I couldn't make it connect. It was a, it was a, the gap was too large. When you go into the military, when you, when you get done with your degree and stuff, one, I need to know with a degree, was there a reason that you went enlisted instead of officer? I tried to go officer and I was denied. I, I tried to go Marine officer and then they real they told me I couldn't even enlist. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> I was like, well, Oh, I might've shot through for the stars a little bit there. Because my mom was mortified for me to enlist, right? Your son was a, you know, she would have been like, we were enlisted, right? So that was like just kind of how I was raised. Like I tried and then once I realized that that was not going to happen, or at least I should say the time was going to be like three years to get my officer packet through in the civilian world, that was not happening if it would have even gone through. And especially in SEALs, right? There's just no way. My grades were not good enough. Why I hadn't done all the extracurriculars. I didn't have nowhere near the packet to get an officer packet. Not and definitely not. So, but I hadn't. I was too stupid to realize that. You know. So I tried. At, at that moment, at all, like we talked about, do you realize, like, oh, hey, th here's a cause and effect here. I, I didn't do this, and now I can't be this. Does it ever make you mad? Does it ever frustrate you? Does it ever anything? Because it always seems to me like they tell you, no, you can't be in the Marines. Okay, I'll go in the Navy. Uh, you can't be an officer here. Okay, I'll be an enlisted SEAL. You never seem to, you just find another route. So does it ever make you angry? Does it ever frustrate you? Does it ever set you back? every time these obstacles, cause we're getting ready to talk about all the waivers that you had to have. No, you're saying, was I, was I a little bit deterred that I couldn't become an officer, that, that, that my decisions had created the reality that I couldn't become that. Right. And, and even more than that, did you ever look at it and go, okay, I'm doing the right thing. Now I finished school. I did this and I still can't do this. Do you ever get frustrated at the process? Oh, when the Na army told me that I couldn't enlist, I went into about a two or three day depression hole that I wasn't sure I was going to get out of because I went home, rode my bike because I had a DUI, right? So I had, had to sell my car the year before. So I ride my bike from the strip mall next to the Walmart with the fucking armed forces recruiting back to my mom's house where I'm sleeping at my mom's house, 23, riding a bike in my hometown. And I went, oh, shit, I'm that guy. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, I'm that guy, man. And luckily, and luckily, I have some delusional confidence, but I was like, oh, no. But I was, I was having a hard time even digging out of that one. So I stayed in my house, and I, that's when I started to research the French Foreign Legion. I was like, okay, well, if I need to go. But I couldn't go because I had student loans and stuff, so I couldn't just leave. And uh, my mom had co-signed. So I, I – because I didn't – she didn't – nobody – I had to pay for my own college and stuff. So I was like, well, I can't just leave. And, well, what am I going to do? I got that kind of booming voice from God or whatever or universal truth. I said, get up and write your charges down. I wrote them on a piece of paper. They didn't look so bad when I had them in black and white. And that's what I always suggest to guys. If they're smashed with stress and they, they can't see a way out, put it on paper. What is concerning you? What are you trying to do? Put it in black and white. A lot of times things become very clear when you can see it clearly. And it doesn't, it's not so daunting. And when I looked at that, it didn't look bad. And I typed it up and I took it to the Navy recruiter because it was my last option. And the guy said, we can work with this because it was all the dispositions were cleared. I mean, I had gone to jail for four months in Santa Cruz County lockdown facility to get cleared off of probation. And so I had I had 
come, I had done what I needed to do to clear some stuff up or as much as I could do to expedite it. And I had no drug convictions. I had no this, but I had a lot of drug charges and I had a lot of this and a lot of that and misdemeanors up the ass. And, but they said it was doable, but I could only have like be a Navy SEAL or some, you know, wrangling turds and then scraping barnacles. That was a pretty, I, the two jobs I could have. So I started down that road of trying to get my weight, get my waivers, getting through MEPS and all that. I, I want to talk something before you actually sign the contracts and everything. You and I have talked about self-confidence, self-esteem, and we've talked about that a lot of people won't realize it about you, but that you you had low self-esteem or a lower self-esteem. Uh, and we've talked about it through training. Can we talk a little bit about that? Because there's the tailor that everyone sees, this bravado and this big guy that's out there showing but you've told me before that there's stuff on the inside yeah like i i've always had some charisma i always had some confidence but i think everybody deals with insecurities right and self-doubt 100 percent. and i am deaf i definitely and proof is in the pudding self-sabotage is is an indicator that there's some lack of self-worth somewhere, right? There's some, some lack of self-worth somewhere deep rooted that you don't think you're worth enough to make better decisions. And that was what had, I had to develop that understanding for a very long time and still work towards it every day, even today, right? There was things I had to check myself on because it's this old way of thinking or whatever's deep rooted inside me Wants to like go burn it all down, right? And, and can talk yourself out of it, right? So before I get too far down the road on that, it's I topically I would say I'm pretty confident, but there's definitely those moments where I I'm like, man, am I good enough? Am I from the right stock? Right? I wasn't raised the same. Oh, man, I man, I I don't deserve that, or that's not possible for me. Well, that's all stuff that I had to deal with and learn how to deliberately fight against and combat against with deliberate self-talk and daily actions to actually subdue those thoughts, those negative below vibrational thoughts. We talked about not getting the college scholarships, not being able to become an officer. Do you think it's when you had those thoughts of, well, maybe you weren't good enough to do it. Do you think that crept into it? And then on top of that, do you think that's why you work so hard now to prove that those things aren't right? It's not just self-talk. It's actual self-action. I would say who knows why people strive for certain things? Is it, are people just ambitious because they have a lack of inherent self-worth and they need to prove something? Maybe, right? Maybe that's possible. Uh, you know, I, I've tried to dissect this a few different ways. Is someone who's super successful in, in business because they're inherently insecure? Maybe not, though. Maybe not, right? So is somebody who sits on the couch and just is chill being them, are they confident? No, right? That's so I, I – there's a few ways to look at this thing. I've thought about it. Like is somebody who's just happy doing nothing, are they super confident or are they delusional? Right. So I think that someone who's I think I'm relatively intelligent, not the smart, sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm smart enough to know myself. And so I understand where I lack. I have a pretty realistic lens on the earth as far as that. And so I knew that that I had things that I lacked. I knew that there were things I should be concerned about. <laughs> right. You know, physically and emotionally and in all different ways. And so those thoughts definitely, I think. The smarter you are, the less, the more you realize you don't know. And, and, and there's, and the holes in your game, right? The, the Dunning Kruger effect, people that are dumb as shit are wildly overconfident. That's the truth, right? That someone's lack of experience in a certain area causes them to be overconfident in their level of ability. And so I would say that there's a piece of that in there and that I was just aware of what, what the holes in the game were. Well, it's interesting that you point that out whenever you say that when people are wildly overconfident, we can take that into your buds training. You were not wildly confident. You you knew that you had to do things and you knew that you would push yourself to do them. 
for a couple of different reasons. But there were all kinds of times at when you were in BUDS training and in uh, Navy SEAL training that you doubted yourself. Oh, yeah. Well, just getting into SEAL training, I was wildly aware that my running was terrible. I, w I knew SEAL, SEAL training was a lot of running, and I couldn't even run a mile. Dead serious. I could not run one mile without stopping. I was 230 pounds, and I could not run around the block without stopping. And I was like, uh-oh. So what did I do? I knew that there was no way I was going to be able to push myself by myself. I just, I didn't have, I don't have, I still don't have that willpower. I, as far as endurance training, I just can't dig that deep <laughs> for long enough. As I needed some external push. And so I sought out the Naval Special Warfare SEAL Motivator that was attached to Naval Special Warfare, formerly a retired Lieutenant Commander, Joe Fuller. Appreciate you, man. And he ran like Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and San Diego, that triangle of area. for, And he would rotate around, and he trained us hard. He pushed us so hard. Man, I lost 40 pounds in six weeks. And then I kept training that, and I did that for eight months. And I was pretty damn good shape, you know, puking every single day. Every day, I got a job stocking boxes at Home Depot at night, and I worked the graveyard shift, drove this shitty-ass car I bought for $500 from my aunt, and packed boxes all night, trained all day for eight months, and took the SEAL screening test every week. I was the only guy to do it every week for eight months, eight, nine months, and then I started getting elevated scores and being top and again and again and again. And then finally I, all my waivers got through. I got letters of recommendation from active duty seals, retired seals. Cause I've been training with them. They see me every week and got my seal contract. How many times did you fail that weekly test? I failed once. That's Excuse it. me. I failed twice. I failed twice. And, but I failed once the first one. And I remember it was kind of eye opening. Because they had the guys who failed step forward and everybody else stepped back. And I, he's like, hey, step forward, Kavanaugh, fail, right off my times. And I looked around and I went, fuck, man, I'm never going to be here again. And that's when I kind of sought out the heavier mentorship as far as the physical training. And, and I was never in there again, except one time where I did go out. I was so locked on. I went out, got drunk, showed up hungover, and fucking failed my run. And that was... <laughs> That was one time I failed the run on, uh, it was like, I had been training for like four or five months and I fucking got smoked on the run. So as you get in and, and you go to training and everything, what is it about the training? One that's motivating you to stay there because I think there's a couple different reasons. And number two, while you're in there, what is it that you're looking for? What is it that you're trying to fix about yourself or what puzzle piece are you trying to put in place? why you're doing this you said fix about yourself that's an interesting way to put it and possibly that's it but there was definitely a puzzle piece i needed proof of who i was i needed and i wanted to operate i didn't i wasn't just there for the title a little bit you know i i was obviously loved the loved the idea of it all and the the respect i wanted respect for sure but i also wanted to prove i had the ability to do it Right, because I had no, I, I didn't show up like, yeah, I got this. I looked at some of the instructors and I went, I think the only difference between me and that guy is time. I definitely had that. I, I could see myself there. I just knew that they were ahead of me in far as time. But I wanted to, I wanted to swim up on the beach, man. I wanted to be deployed with a gun, and I wanted to be working with the dudes I was with, and I wanted to be with night vision on, jumping out of planes. Right, that's why I did it. And I wanted to be doing the bad, most badass thing I could, the, you could find in the United States, too. We talked about this kind of last time, is, man, there's a piece that, there's a little bit of that ego, right? I mean, I, I didn't want to do regular military. That was not an option for me at all. I, I had no desire for that. I wanted to be in the elite group. That was it. There was no plan B for me is, was regarding that. So. To get through it, there was no option. I didn't, uh, there was no way I was going to be in the regular military. I, I knew I was going to be so miserable. I couldn't do it. 
when you have the option of you make it through this or you're going to be on a ship doing whatever, a turd wrangler, whatever it is that you said you wanted to do, how bad does that scare you? Like, well, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do turd wrangler. That's for sure. Well, and, <laughs> yeah, let, let me say that another way. I, I, I kind of said that wrong. Anything that you could do, you know, when they put you into yeah. the fleet and they make you do whatever it is that you can do or that you decide on that you, I guess that you want to do when you don't make it through there. How much does that keep you up at night? How much are you thinking about that in every single evolution, every single training piece that you're doing? When I would wake up in the morning and we had some kind of big evolution that I knew I would like every O course was close to me. Every run, I woke up nervous as shit. I was like, because it, it was, man, I have got to pass this. <laughs> it was, I have got to pass this. There's no option. I, it was terrifying. It was terrifying. Like waking up for pool competency test, that underwater, getting the crap kicked out of you for 20 minutes. I was doing breath exercises, thinking, listening to class, classical music, trying to relax myself, getting, so I wasn't going to you know, be using too much oxygen, nervous when I showed up. Is Man, I was thinking deep, deep about just, and this is kind of where you start to live. You have got to just focus on what you want to have happen. I was actively, deliberately thinking about only what I want to have happen, which was pass. I couldn't even think about failing. It was, it, I couldn't even spend a moment of time on that. Let me ask you in a different way. How do you deal with that stress? I know that you thought about it. I know that you did breath exercises and stuff, but let me explain. Like when people get nervous when they're testing or they're doing whatever, some people talk a lot. Some people go quiet and just focus on what's going on. Some people can't kind of get out of their own way. How is it that you dealt with it? Because that was an everyday, every hour thing while you were in training. Yeah, yeah. I was really terrified about the things outside of my control, right? And so that stuff I had to, right, background checks, right? That, that stuff was always creeping back up. That was always kind of this cloud looming. But I was had to learn how to compartmentalize. And I will get into the exact kind of how my demeanor is. But I would compartmentalize the things I couldn't deal with as much as I could and focus on the things I could have control over. And I get a little quiet. I focus as much as I can. I try to stay as present as possible. So I try to breathe deep, but I'm still kind of joking about stuff. I'll still, I don't get totally quiet. I'm not like that. I'll still joke with my close friends or throw a comment here and there. I try to keep a comedic lens a little bit. As you go through, do you feel yourself getting better. I've heard some guys, they get through training and they say, I didn't feel any different. As you go through training, as you pass these evolutions, as you come closer and closer to, to getting your trident, do you feel different? Do you feel like a different person? Do you feel like you've accomplished something or are you just still concerned on that very, very end goal? And let's be honest, the end goal is operator in a combat zone. It's not getting your trident. It's not going to a team. It's you in combat, you and MVGs jumping out of a plane. When I got my trident, I felt different. For sure. A thousand percent. I felt immediately different the next day. I was like, finally. Yes, I knew it. I was like in my head, in my heart. I was like, I fucking knew it. I could do this. And I did. And so the people that had remembered me from the beginning, like my mom, who was like, man, are you sure? I was like, I told her, I was like, I'm not sure, but I think in my heart I can do this. And because you can't be sure, right? You can't fucking be sure about the future. And so when it was, it came and they saw all the stuff I had to get through to get there. It felt good. And it felt good to reflect back on, man, I went to jail for this, man. Right. I requested to go to jail to get in the military to do this. And now I'm a seal when everybody said it was fucking impossible to be walking out of jail trying to be a seal. And from that was eight, nine, ten, two and a half years from the day I walked out of jail, I was getting a trident pinned on me. So I knew that if you had you had this seriously almost delusional goal it is possible 
Man, it is. It, so it definitely expanded my scope of confidence. I was way more confident when I got my trident. But that fades quick, right? <laughs> then it's the next thing. Even my, the energy was different. I was definitely a little more confident. I felt not cocky yet, obviously. I, I mean, I, I knew what I was showing up at the team about, but I was definitely in a much more jovial mood because I was like this for years, focused on that goal. Years. And by the time I got it, my, my scope started to open up and I could feel like I could breathe for the first time in a long time. Was the confidence for you or was the confidence for all those naysayers to you that, yeah, fuck you, I told you I could do it, or was it confidence for you in your abilities? Oh, it wasn't. It, I didn't really have a lot of naysayers. I would say, like, I didn't have people, because I was a pretty damn good athlete and shit in my life. Like, I, was, right. I wasn't, like, some random, like, so I, I, people were like, well, maybe if there's a, you know, you know but, I, but I had a terrible track record of my life of being able to see things through. Right. Or a complete something. And, you know, uh, but I had ability. And so it was I didn't have a lot of people that were like, there's no way you can do this. So it wasn't I didn't feel like that type of chip on my shoulder. OK, I just felt confident for myself. Like I was like, man, because it was fucking hard. You know, It was so hard. There was so many things and painful things you had to push through. Not to mention in Buds, but in SQT, man, I mean, we, we Alaska, that shit's hard, man. And, you know, a lot of stuff you have to pass and luck, luck, right? There's a lot of luck involved and not getting hurt and stuff like that. I was just so grateful. I felt great. Is that the first time you think you felt that kind of confidence in your whole life? It was the happiest I'd ever been by far. It was the happiest I'd ever been in my life was that day. Did you think it could get any better? I know it's the happiest, but did you ever go, man? It can even go up from here. Did you think this is it? This, this is the mountaintop. No, I, I was really happy, but then I was focused on the next goal. I was still very right. present. I was still very, and, and, and in the bad and good way, right? Because I was still very immature. I was still super immature in that I couldn't really see the future. I wasn't thinking in, in, in terms of that, really. I was just like, Okay, what's the next cell block? What's the next training cycle? What's the next this? What's the next that? Because I had no plans on getting out. When I became a SEAL, I was, I was going to go career. That's all I wanted to do since I was a child. So I was like, this is it. I'm here. Right? Now it's just, you know, what's the next step? Maybe screen for development group. Maybe I was seeing, but I wasn't even there yet because I was like, okay, we got these deployments. I'm going to try to get sniper, try to get this, that, that, and just crush. I was very compartmentalized in the in the SEAL team and in the whatever workup we were in or whatever training cycle we were in. When you say that, and we've talked about those small windows in your life where you get ultra focused on what you have to do. I believe that in the beginning of you going to SEAL Team 7 and you, you did a couple schools, you got a couple certifications, you fell in, you're very laser focused. Uh, you're very, you know, focused on your growth and all of that kind of stuff. And I feel as you get a little further into your career, that stuff starts sliding away again. Would you agree with that? Oh, hundred percent. Okay. Cause you start to realize you get complacent, right? And, and I think this happens to a lot of people. It happens in people's jobs. It happens in people's marriages. It happens in people's friendships, right? When you start dating a chick and you're you start dating people's wives, like, everyone's on their best behavior, right? And then, you start getting a little comfortable. That's the truth. And you really have to be deliberate and mature about maintaining that forward pressing evolution and being your best self. It's, it takes active effort and it also takes self-awareness, which I did not have. And what I think a lot of people lack self-awareness. That's most people I think lack self, lack true self-awareness. And so because you have to be honest about your shortcomings and that's difficult to do. Uh, you know, it's hard for us to see our, our own faults. And so as I started to realize, Oh, I didn't really have to show up to work at the, uh, you know, early every day. Right. I didn't really have to show up. You know, I was still loving where I was doing and loving what I was doing, but I was like, eh, you know, we could stay out and party a little bit longer, you know, and show up because, 
you know, and now I had a little bit of seniority and it was, it wasn't an active thing. It was kind of a, just a sliding scale. Started to get a little more comfortable. I was still training hard as shit. I was still in really good shape. I was still all those things. And so I, that was part of it though, is that you could lie to yourself and go, well, I'm still crushing it. I'm in great shape. I'm getting early promotes and all this stuff. And I'm still doing all this other stuff, right? So, so it's like, well, I obviously can do all this at the same time because, but you can't bend your reality that for like that for long, uh, for too long. It's impossible, right? The uni universal laws will come crashing down on you. Well, that self-awareness where a lot of people aren't self-aware, I think, and, and I want to see if you agree, people aren't self-aware because they're so busy looking at what everyone else is doing around them finding out what they're doing wrong so they don't have to look at what they're doing wrong. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. It's easier to be distracted than point the fingers at yourself and, and look at your faults. It's, it's easier to be distracted. And, and this thing, right, that thing is probably the biggest cause of tumbling self-awareness, plummeting, is... It's, it can be a unbelievable tool for self-development and, and actually learning self-awareness, but you have to actively seek that stuff out, right? You have to actively seek that stuff out. And if you don't, you're just going to start regressing. And that's what I think we see so much is people are regressing. They're regressing emotionally with connection, the ability to communicate and definitely self-awareness. You see people out screaming about some protesting about stuff they don't even know what the fuck they're talking about right like what's jordan peterson say you know people are trying to rearrange the world and their house is in shambles right trying to rearrange the fucking world and they can't even arrange their room it's a joke because it's you gotta you gotta be honest about where you're at <laughs> man you know i'm a loser in my rooms and trash that's tough to say out loud and actually understand right and so it's easier to latch on to some external fake faux movement. And so that's what people do. Well, I think that goes back to what you said earlier. The dumbest people in the room have the most confidence about what they could do. And it's, it all goes back to self-awareness. Yeah. Self-awareness and self-awareness and ownership, right? They go hand in hand because you can't take ownership if you're not self-aware Right. And so those two things are, are what we see why the pendulum has swung so far, which I have faith it's coming back though, DJ. It's coming back, bro. I, I, I think so. I think everything's cyclical. I agree with you. Yeah. Let's talk about the first time you're in combat. Let's talk about the first time you've reached that level. You're an operator. You're doing what you wanted to do. You said that was the happiest you've ever been when you got your trident. How are you feeling? with that finally when i got deployed it was it felt great it felt great to be growing a beard getting weird out away from the flagpole you know shirt off sitting in a sniper tower and mind you my first deployment was pretty slow right it was at yemen you know but we were still kind of out there so but it felt good to be working it felt good to be, you know, out there just on a camp with, you know, handful of other team guys and that's it. And you're just putting up HESCO walls and stringing razor wire and, you know, out at night doing whatever training with the counterterrorism units and stuff. And it was, it felt great. I didn't care what I was doing. I was so happy to be doing it. It was, that's what it felt like. I was really, I felt like I was in my place. My soul was quieted. My soul was like as calm as it had ever been. How are you looking at everything else in life? Okay, your your career is going great. Your professional life is going great. How's the rest of your life looking? I was so streamlined. I mean, I had a girlfriend at the time. She had some problems developing, which I didn't really, I wasn't really tracking on because we didn't live together. But we had been together for a little while. You know, hot chick. And we, we had a good relationship when we were around each other. And you know, I was just looking at, okay, where are we going to be living next? And we were moving into a high rise downtown with a couple other teammates and it was great. <laughs> you know, I had a sick truck and streamlined life and loans, student loans were paid off. And I, you know, I had, I had chalked away all my bonuses to my student loans immediately. 
dudes are buying trucks and stuff. I paid off all my debt. That's what I did. So I was like free and clear. I had money in the bank and man, I felt great. So if everything's going great in your life, when do you start seeing yourself slide a little bit? Because there's, there's things that pop up. There's a couple of arrests while you're in the teams, you know, NCIS and Jag by the end, you and I talked and you said they were out for you by the end. Yeah. When do you start feeling it go away? Is it during the deployments? Is it when you're back in training cycles? When is it that you kind of feel it start to slip away from you? I was locked on on the deployment, right? And then when I come back, it was party time. We're back, right? We're back. I'm living downtown. So we're out. I'm drinking too much. Boom, get arrested, right? <laughs> it's true. Get arrested outside the bar, drunk in public, right? That's how it goes down. And that's as simple as it was, right? Not like fighting and doing all this stuff, just like out walking. The cop's like, man, you're drunk, like that. And so uh, that got swept under the rug, though. The cop didn't do anything. I was, you know, that wasn't an issue. I didn't really get arrested. He took me to, the, to some drunk tank in a warehouse, slept with a bunch of bums, and then I walked home. And then that was right when I got back from my first appointment. And I'm locked on, you know, and there's kind of, and then we're kind of out part, but I'm training and I'm focused and I'm still doing training and really happy training cycles. I'm getting more schools and getting more good reviews and good, you know, everything was going pretty smooth, but the momentum was starting to pick up. As I say to guys, when you're peaking is when you need to slow the fuck down. When you're start, when things are like stacking really well, that's when you need to be on high alert. That's when you need to be on high alert. And so things were peaking for me unbelievably. Right when I could remember being my happiest since I had got my trident, dead serious. This was like the next wave of happiness. I was crushing it. I was stacked. I was in good shape. And I, I had you know a lot of stuff going on, good social life, good schools, good projected career path. And I'm like running a lot of stuff now. I have a lot of responsibility and doing well. And then I go on a JTAC trip and hit a guy in a bar and boom, that just, that was like the crushing blow. Well, not the final blow, but a huge blow that caused me so much shit and money and time and stress and stuff for years, for two years after that, that took me from that one punch. Let me ask you something, uh, and it just keeps coming back to me as you talk. When you said that you got arrested, you got back from your first deployment, it's party time, you're drinking, you have to go to a drunk take, you're sleeping with a bunch of bums. You go on this JTAC mission, you hit a guy, all the trouble starts over. I'm just wondering, at, at what point do you maybe look at yourself in a drunk take with a bunch of bums and go, I'm a fucking elite operator. Like, I have responsibilities that people couldn't even fathom. And I'm in a drunk tank with a bunch of bums. Does that ever occur to you? Or are you still not self-aware? You still not mature enough to see it at all. I'm just like, Hey man, Vikings got smashed. You know, that's how I like, I'm like, man, dude, the fucking warrior spirit, man, fucking warriors been getting fucking wasted there since the beginning of time, man. It's a violent world. It's like, that's kind of how I could like justify it. I'm like, man, fuck it. Who cares? Right. It's just part of the game, man. It's just part of that rough spirit and shit happens. And so, and that's the kind of how I've lo looked at it, man. Was anyone around you going, Hey bro, slow down. Well, not really. I mean, not, there was times where I was, you know, definitely pushing the pace in some capacity, but a lot of times it was good it was fun right most of the times it was pretty damn chill until the few times it wasn't right and that's kind of how it is right it's all good until it's not and if you're playing with fire like i was man you're gonna get fucking burned and that's what like when i talk to guys i go dude it's cool now wait until it's not <laughs> and then it's gonna be really not cool right and that one not cool it, like I was so locked on for 99% of everything I did. And that 1% I would fuck up would wash away all 99, right? The, the, one off oh, fuck removes a thousand attaboys. That's what I had to learn over time, right? Is that I was like, man, I'm doing all this and I had all these accolades. And then the next thing I know, I'm the fucking shit bag.
right? Getting fucking yelled at by the CEO, you know, in front of everybody. You know, it's like, damn, right? It, it comes at you. Life comes at you fast, man. If you want to, you want to be fucking around, yeah, fuck around and find out. I I wonder though, when you do this, is there ever any concern? In your mind, I, I know that you said that's the warrior's mantra and stuff, but we talked about how worried you were to go out to the fleet. You wanted to do this forever. Was there ever a point in time where you thought about like, hey, if I keep fucking around, I might not be wearing this uniform anymore. I might be doing something else because as we move through your career and we're going to get to NCIS and JAG and all that kind of stuff, do you ever worry that this can come to an end? I was worried when I got arrested, right? And I was like, man, I'm going to get kicked out. But I still couldn't connect the dots on the actions that led me. The thought process that led me. I was just like, how do I get out of this? Right? And I had a want to not do this, get it, get in trouble anymore. I had this desire that I'm like, man, I don't want to be fucking getting in trouble like this anymore. This is miserable. I felt like I was going to die, man. I was so stressed out. I felt like walking through quicksand and, but I didn't know how, right? I didn't know how I didn't have, I didn't understand. I didn't have the tools to understand what I needed to do to just maintain clarity and inner peace. I didn't know what I had to do. I just, knew I wanted to not feel like this anymore, but I didn't know what to do. Well, let me ask you, and I want you to be honest with me, especially in my line of work, you see a lot of people that are sorry that they got caught, not sorry that they did it. Do you think at any point you were sorry that you got caught, that all of this was going to happen? Or were you genuinely sorry for how you behave for what you did? I was sorry for, having lost control of myself. Okay. Right. I was sorry for losing my wits. I was so sorry for that. Right. I like that. That is if if I could be like the most honest, that's a, that's about as far as I could take it. Right. I don't want to want to hurt somebody or do something, but I was, I was just like, man, what a, what fucking man has no control over himself. Like, no control, like blacked out, no control. Right. And that was like, I saw as pathetic, man. And just like, I felt really terrible about that. Sure. I felt shitty. I got caught and I, but I really tried to correct shit. Right. The problem was, is like, I didn't just go right. All these, all these like things that happened, I didn't just get arrested and then go right back to what I was doing. Like the next day, of course. that's not how it would go. Right. I would be like, man, I want, then I would just like try to be doing the right stuff. Like, no, no, I got to like stay focused and like, Hey, come on. And then I just be like, eh, all right. It'd be like that, like over like a month. Right. And they would just, and then I'd be kind of like back in it and I was trying, I just didn't have the tools and the self-worth to really in the direction and the, the long vision to see what choices would end up where. And so that's what, was a fucking long process. It took me a long till my mid thirties to figure that out, man. Well, let's talk about one of those mistakes and actually going to jail while you're on active duty, you have to take leave to go. Yeah. So it was because of that. It just, I ended up going to Iraq in between this. I went on Iraq on bail and came back to a felony court case, aggravated assault case, where I was facing six years in prison plus three parole for a DBH. And so I was just walking the plank, right? I, I, I was still training and trying to stay focused in the present, but I had this thing looming. And then one day the court case came and, and on the day of the court case, I'm sitting in my dress blues on the toilet after just having been at the strip club all the night before. So I think I'm walking to my death pretty much. I'm like, fuck it. So I'm hung over as shit about to go to court for a three day trial mind you. So I'm just like, whatever, my life's over. And then I get a call from my attorney saying, Hey, they have a plea deal for you. They're going to give you four years supervised probation, which is maxed out on like two small charges, two smaller charges. And you got to pay this guy a fuck ton of money in restitution and you got to pay it 
all up front in cash or else it's going to stay a felony. And I went, okay, man. So I sold my truck. I gave him all the rest of my Iraq money and pretty much emptied my bank account and got formal probation on interstate compact transfer and from Idaho to California. So I couldn't really leave San Diego without approval. I couldn't have a weapon, couldn't drink, couldn't do drugs and all that stuff and paper handcuffs, which is very hard. You know, I was a seal. So I had to get, it was a lot of moving pieces, but I did it and signed it. And then part of it was I had to go to jail for like two and a half, three weeks in Idaho. And so that's what I did. <laughs> that's what I did, man. In my dress blues, showed back up a couple weeks later with the check and the, the bailiffs wouldn't even put me in handcuffs. They're like, we're not going to put an active duty seal in fucking handcuffs for this. And so they just walked me in the back. That was cool of them. And so I checked into jail in my dress blues. And still nothing is registering with you. Like, fuck, like something's got to get. Oh, it was here. registered. Oh, it was registering. It was registered. Man, I was going to jail, man, putting in my reds. And I was in with all felony guys with felonies and uh, in, a, in 180, 180, 180, which is the guard and two, two tiers and all that. And it wasn't the first time I'd been in jail. So I, it was not new to me. And that's what I did my thing. And I got on my program doing my push ups and stuff and doing a whole deal. And that's what I did, man. And I just did push ups and got my shit and it went in and went out. When you're going through all this, you said you're, you're trying to focus on training. You're trying to get ready for that next deployment, all that kind of stuff. Honestly, how much could you focus on the training? How much could you focus on what you were about to do when you knew that you could be possibly going to jail, kicked out of the Navy, uh, be on probation. I mean, we're talking almost 10 years total for all this. How much can you actually focus? How much can you split yourself into what you need to do in both areas? Because they're both very important. Man, I, I became a master at compartmentalization. I would say part of my training and why I'm so good at it is because of some of that shit. I can compartmentalize with the best of them. I could set that aside, knowing my whole life might be ruined, and focus 100%. And it takes active effort and you have to do it deliberately. It's not just like happen naturally. I would have to prepare myself in the morning, get sits, turn it off, box it up, put it away. And be, and I wouldn't think about it. Not one second while I was doing shit. And that, that just, I would, I would do that every day for fucking years, <laughs> for years until that year and a half. And, um, it was tough. It was hard. You know, it took a lot of active effort to learn how to do that. It's got to eat at you, though. I mean, it's got to be destroying you from the inside. Oh, it was the off time that was the worst part, right? It was, the, it was the, when I would get back home, and I was like, ugh. <laughs> and then I'd be fine and present, and then the wave would come, and I'd go, oh, shit, this mall might be for nothing, right? It was more the quiet times that were the hard part, you know, sitting on a roof in Iraq on watch, Right. Those were some tough times, too. Right. I'm sitting out there watching. And then sometimes that wave would come. and I'm like, fuck, man. Right. And uh, so I don't worse that stress on anybody. And guess what? People don't have to deal with that if they make the right choices. Right. I go. That's why I say I'm a cautionary tale, man. If I'm anything, I'm a cautionary tale. You don't have to do this shit. man. You don't have to put yourself through this shit. You don't. man. I don't. I got more gray hair than a 38 year old should have, man. I was gray as fuck by 30. Dead serious. And uh, none of them, this was this is probably not helping. So it's about living a line and it's about those daily practices, which I didn't have a hold of that yet. So let's talk about it as you get a little further. I want to talk about the end of your naval career because I think there's some interesting points there. I guess once again, we can say NCIS, JAG, all these people are like, you know what? Fuck this guy. We're going to find something on him. They're coming for you. Let's Let's talk about what they found and kind of what it led to because this is i think one of the best parts of your story to me because when you describe what it felt like when they told you you were leaving i really want to get into that so let's talk about what they found how they kind of got you because all this happened and nothing you you your command backed you up you made it through all of this stuff and then you get what happens next yeah and like you said it, it had been it had resonated when i came back and i was checking into in my administrative uniform, my Navy uniform, my Trident going to 
fucking downtown San Diego at the probation office. People looking at me like, God damn, bro. And so I was locked on. I, when people were asking me to go out, I was at weddings and stuff. They're like, can you drink? I was like, no, I can't. And I didn't. I gave wedding speeches dead sober, you know, at seal weddings and shit during this time. I was like, man, I can't do anything. And I fucking was holding that line for a while, for about six weeks, <laughs> for about six fucking weeks. <laughs> right. That's about, and I was, but it was like, I was, it was an active thing. I was trying, man. And then, you know, some girls like, Hey, you want to go to Palm Springs? You know, and then it just kind of, <laughs> right. And, uh, I just was like, yeah, maybe I'm kind of gone. They're not going to check. Right. And then you've already cracked the, you've already cracked the, the bottle back open. And so now it's like, okay. And right. And then you start getting comfortable and used to it. And so then I'm back on, I meet this girl that I'm in fucking love with. So I'm like riding high, go to a concert, drinking heavy, doing whatever, kind of forgetting about me being in paper handcuffs. And I get clipped up for doing some dumb shit in a fucking golf cart. And a cops roll up on me, and that's how easy it happens, man. Lost my SEAL career because I got in a fucking golf cart on probation, drunk. And that started up, you know, a chase, and I got out, and I tried running because I knew they were going to get away. Sick of a dog, tased me, or tried to tase me. It was a whole fucking thing, and created a whole scene, cascading snowball, that started from me not acting right, me just being, being, doing whatever I wanted. Even with, you know, and not seeing the possible repercussions of me doing whatever I wanted and not abiding by my probationary terms. And I got arrested. And so I'm there. I'm another aggravated arrest or an aggravated assault charge, which ended up getting dropped and stuff. But still, it had popped all the lights back on. So now my probation officer's on my ass. Now, right, I'm on another violent charge. It's just now Idaho's up my ass, too. I got three attorneys now. It is all cascading down on me. My sister picks me up from jail. I bailed out fast enough to where I wasn't supposed to, but I had enough I had enough credit on my credit card where I could bail out fast enough before it processed because I'm on probation. Technically, I'm not allowed to bail out. I just did it fast enough before the computer system caught me. And my sister picked me up, and I'm just quiet. And she goes, this is it, isn't it? I said, yep. She goes, yep that you really fucked up this time. I said, yep, I did. And I knew it was done, right? I still get chills when I think about that moment. I, I knew it was done. I get a call from the command. They're like SEAL Team 7. They don't know what's going on, right? It's all, it's all a fucking clusterfuck. And that was it, man. And so they drug test me. I pass. They fucking, then they come back at me with a steroid test after they read the police, which was like, I pulled out four tasers and it took seven cops to get me on the ground and I fought off a German shepherd. They're like, this guy's obviously on performance enhancing drugs. And guess what? I was, and I lit every fucking light on that thing on up. They sent it to the Olympic center in UCLA paid like thousands of dollars just for me to have this test, which isn't normal Navy protocol. And so they did an Olympic test on me and I lit a bunch of those up. And so that was it. And that was looked at as a zero tolerance. I've heard some people say I can actually fight the actual disposition of that, but it doesn't really matter to me, man. It, it was at that time I was toast and I just relegated to uh, man, this is it. And you know what? Here's an interesting thing. When they told me I was getting tested again, I had a piss test, man, I had a fake dick in my locker and I was like, I looked at it and I went, fuck it. Let's do this. I knew I was going to fail. I knew what was going to happen. I was like, let's, let's fucking charge the machine gun nest. Let's fucking just do this. Right. I was like, I had the option to, I, I, I could have fucked around with that test and I didn't. And that's not saying like, I'm all good. I was like, I'm just going to take what comes from my decisions. Right. I, I had, I had to come to some surrender at some point. Right. So that's where I was at. Well, I almost wonder, though, if that goes back to that whole self-worth thing, if you were like, yeah, I guess I really don't deserve all this. And you were like, fuck it. Let's just ride this thing out. Possibly. Possibly. Well, I want to talk about whenever you're getting out, you're processing out. It takes a while, of course, to get to. You had told me before that you, you just went out to your car when you were waiting around. And can we talk about that a little bit? Because. Oh, man. 
Whew. I mean, it's crazy to hear you say it, though. Man, I when they would because I would have to muster right the rest of my platoons off training, which was brutal. So I'm pulled out of the platoon, and I'm like mustering with the support. You know, they're doing the little command PTs. I'm not doing those though. But luckily, the master chief was like, "Hey, bro, just check in and handle your shit." He knew I was I was at the at the end of my life. Right. And so he's like, handle your stuff. And I would, but I, but I, they were like, still stay around. Like I might get called for like an hour after, right. That type of thing. So I had to kind of hang around, but I just could not be around people because everyone was asking me questions and shit. I just couldn't emotionally deal with it. So I would just go in my car, my shitty Honda Civic, cause I had sold my truck. Right. And sit in the fucking passenger seat and just like in the fetal position, man. And just sometimes I think if I remembered probably crying, Sometimes I was just too fucking sad to even cry, man. I was just so toast. Uh, I couldn't even barely breathe, man. I was done. Well, as you get processed out and you leave, you go to Hawaii. Now, I think this was your lowest point and your turning point in your life. Uh, Hawaii is a big part of your story to me. And mostly for going there and thinking I can kick everything and... It wasn't really that easy. Well, there was a gap in between there. It was two years where I was crushing it. I walked Doing right out of the Navy out of jail. Well, I walked right out into that supervisor position. So I, I did a lateral move financially on a huge project. Right. So now I start doing Adderall, Xanax, lead, no governor now, no governor every day at night, right? Not during work. That's how I could lie to myself about what I was doing. Beautiful girlfriend by the beach. Then I start working for a venture capitalist. I get out of that job and start pitching decks, raising millions of dollars, doing all this stuff, right? CEO of a different company, launch a marijuana distribution company, doing all this shit. And now I stack on a fentanyl opioid habit at night, every day for a year. I didn't miss a fucking day of all that stuff. I just listed every day. I was flying, man, and still raising millions, still doing this, still building out facilities, still meeting with congressmen, still doing all this shit. And I was, man, nobody can tell me shit. I'm crushing it and doing all this stuff. But man, my life was, man, my relationship was tumbling down, right? I was, this is, this is the time where I've been emotionally explosive with people, violent, out of fucking control. I was dangerous man i was a dangerous human being right i was came crashing down smashed my face did a line of fentanyl fucking smashed my face on a marble table split it the fucking right open girlfriend's in blood everywhere i'm like at a business like trip so it, it, everything came crashing down right every i fell on my face literally and that's when the boss was like hey man you were an asset now you're a liability right and that sat with me hard. And so then I was like, you got to get out of here. So I did. And that's when I went to Hawaii. And that's when I'm trying. That's when I did. I got off opioids and fentanyl in the first couple of weeks. And that was brutal. That was really brutal. I didn't realize what real addiction was, right? That was a need. I needed it. Talk about addiction right at the beginning. I didn't realize I needed it. I needed it to like not feel like I was dying. Because I, I had never been off it. I was felt like I my skin was crawling. I just couldn't, and I couldn't sleep. It was brutal. But I came out of that fog. Now I'm drinking, got, a, got, a, got rid of that, right? And so trying to just live right and go to the gym and try to, but I had no purpose. My life was falling apart. Now I run out of money, and now I'm homeless in my truck with the shotgun on my lap when everything came crashing down, and I realized I got nowhere to go. I got no gas. I'm parked in the jungle. I got a gun, and... That's it. How many days? I was there for about three days. Three days. And just, I would take little walks through the jungle, man, and think and sit on like a tree stump. No shirt, just straight native. Just fucking no food, no water. Nothing, man. Just a bottle of vodka and, and Adderall. And pretty much. And that was it, man. And then I would just sat there with this fucking shotgun, just debating different ways to kill myself without making a mess. Like I, I wasn't sad. That was where I was at. I wasn't sad anymore. I was so exhausted of trying. 
I was didn't couldn't even be sad because to be sad you have to have some hope. I had I was done. I was past that. I was trying to think about how to get rid of my own body without making a fucking mess. I was trying to look at what hills were big enough or cliffs it was not tall enough i was like i'll fucking live i know i wouldn't so i was like maybe there's a volcano that was actually erupting right near where i was at i was like maybe i'll jump in a fucking volcano and that made me laugh right and that's kind of what pulled me out of it is i fucking i go dude you're fucking ridiculous i was like jump in a fucking volcano bro i was like bro you can't even kill yourself normal i was like dude you're fucking and you're selfish as shit. I was like, dude, listen to what you're talking about. Crying about you, 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 you. You have a mom, a sister. I'd cut everybody out. Like I wasn't, you know, I was just cut off just in my own pity party. And that's what I said. Fuck it. I'm going in the fence foreign legion, man. This is bullshit. I was like, man, I'm being a huge pussy. If I'm going to die, at least let me do it with my boots on. If they're, maybe they'll send me to deploy somewhere. I was like, that's kind of how I looked at it. I, I want to ask about the ideation that you had when, whenever it comes up. And you say that you have no hope that you're just tired. How scary is that? Dude, it was the worst feeling I've ever had. I don't, I don't think I've ever had a worse feeling than that moment. It was, I don't like the word hope. This was hopelessness. It was, it was done. I was just like, there's his, there, I couldn't even muster the strength to try anymore. Which that's why I understand where people can get to this point where they're just so that's why I'm very I can speak to people who are at low points because man, I understand it. When you're just have you're just you you're tired, man. Tired of trying. It's just it's pointless. And that's that's how I saw it. It's fucking this is pointless, man. Why do I keep looking doing this? This is absolutely ridiculous. So that was a terrible feeling. But we go back to that purpose thing. You said you had no purpose. You're not really looking for purpose. You have no hope of ever getting the purpose again. I think it was a while, but you talked to your mom on the phone, right? Yeah, I called her after like the third day. And I was like, you know what? I've been in this jungle. I'm about at my rock bottom, I think. I told her. I said, I'm fine, but I'm like, I'm going to join the French Foreign Legion. And I'm going to be gone for a while, pretty much. And she's like, you know, she was worried and stuff and. But I just kind of let her know what was up. Do you think that anyone else is concerned with you? When, when you're in those three days, when you're not talking to anyone, when you've cut everyone out of your life, is there ever a thought that goes through your head like, well, someone gives a shit about me, or is that gone? Well, well I, had, I had cut off for those three days from my family, my family, but I had cut off for three months in Hawaii. I, cut every, I changed my phone number. I I had no social media, nothing at, at that time. But why? I, I, I got to know. I got to understand I was so why. so fucking sad, man. And embarrassed. I had no title, no money, no anything. I had, I had just destroyed my life. I was fucking embarrassed. But, okay. And I got to ask you, because you're, you're becoming an expert in this area now where you can talk to people, but... When you go back to that and you say you were embarrassed, what good does that do to cut you off from everyone? That That's that whole thing where, yes, you're embarrassed, but you can never get past it because you can never confront it. So I'm, I'm just trying to understand with the mental state that you've been through your whole life and, and the training that you've been in the combat deployments, how do you get to that point where you think that you're so embarrassed that you could never face anyone again? Well, it's not that I knew I needed time. I knew okay. I wasn't going to be gone forever. I need, I needed to figure out still what the fuck happened. Okay. Because there was still shit up in the air. There was still stuff at work. There was, there was relationship. There was still like stuff in the air. There was legal shit. There was like stuff floating. I needed to disappear. And so I was like, that's why I was like, I'm not going to put out anything. It was a strategic decision. It wasn't okay. like. Okay. Yeah, it was a it was a strategic decision. I didn't want to involve anybody that didn't want to be involved with anything. It was like some weird. There was some questionable stuff with three letter agencies, possibly. So I was like, I had to go away. And so, do you think that made it worse or better? Way better. <laughs> Way better. Okay. For sure, because I had to sit with myself. I had I. 
I couldn't eat. There wasn't even anything to explain because I didn't know what the fuck was going on. I, I needed to figure out what was going on first. I needed quiet. I needed to sit with myself and like sit with thought for a while and sort through some of the emotions and some of the reflection before I could like bring on some uh, buddy's additional emotional stuff. I couldn't, I didn't have the bandwidth for it. I think that's important for people. I, I don't always say that isolation is a bad thing, man. Any hero's journey requires isolation. Look at any story. Look at the Bible, man. Isolation is a piece of it. You can't be always connected, man. You got to have some time where you're alone. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, the Bible, because you have always, and I think this will be strange for people to hear, but you've always been a religious guy. You've always believed in a higher power. Yes. Do you ever fall back on that at this time? No, never. I always have had a really solid connection from it since I was really young. I understood that there's this guiding force, and I've always felt the presence of that in things and I, re I see it, the, the oneness and the connectivity of everything. So I've, I've understood that from a really young age. And so I, uh, I yeah. Well, I, I guess my question would be, at this time, when you're going through this three months of kind of self-isolation, and, and even when we get to the three days of ideation and stuff, do you ever fall on your faith and, and say, like, hey, God or a higher power, like, Point out the direction. Show me which way to go. Does that ever happen? No, it was the, the, the conversation was more like, man, I don't know if I can do this. I don't okay. know. I don't know if I can do what you have. I don't know what, if I can do what you have planned for me, man. This is fucking getting too hard. Right. That, that's kind of what it was. And I, and I, I can't see the forest through the trees on this one. Right. That's, that's what it was. It was never making, eh, man, fuck you. Why? I never, I've never like had that type of, because I've always kind of understood it was for a larger purpose. I just didn't know why, and I didn't want to be dealing with it, right? And But I also understood that it was necessary, even in the worst of it, unfortunately. I was like, man, I know this. I don't know if I can keep powering through this, though. I was like, fuck, man. So when you decide on the Foreign Legion, and you decide I'm going to go over, I'm going to become a different person, because literally that's what you do. On the mm -hmm. way over there, are there any second thoughts? Are there anything before you go knock on this gate and get introduced into the Foreign Legion? Uh, you know, I flew there and it was raining. And I remember I came from Hawaii to fucking Paris. It's pouring rain. And I go, wow, man. I go, I'm fucking here. This is going to suck. And I, I, I didn't. I never thought about turning around. I knew it wasn't an option. And... So I knew I, what I had to do. I had to clear my system of any drugs. That was the first thing. So, and I knew I didn't have a lot of money. So I had to go to a hostel in like downtown Paris and, and just run and drink water and fucking eat. I had like no money, man. I was eating like super cheap McDonald's trying to just get some calories in, man. Still enough money to buy a bottle of vodka, though. I was still doing that, right? Sipping on a bottle of vodka the night before. I called my mom and I said, you know, I'm about to go in and do this. She's like, you don't have to do this. I said, I do. I have got to do this. I remember this conversation so clear. I said, I don't know why, but I know I need the time and I need to mature a little bit. I'm still fucking too immature. I, I don't know how to live right. So I said to her and she's like, all right. And so that next morning, I, you know, that next afternoon, I ended up going in, taking my train out to Fort Nogent on the eastern, on the outskirts of the eastern side of Paris little different than Navy SEAL training or a little different than U.S. military training? Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Oh, man. Man, dude. It was brutal. It was a baptism in humility. It, well, they don't give, you know, if you ask, oh, did they carry you a SEAL? Fucking no. <laughs> they don't give a shit who I was, man. Nothing. They only cared about what I could do then. And... You know, it's, you know, some, you, you get the, you get some guys that were like, damn dude, you know, they, they knew kind of what the deal was, but I wasn't advertising it. You know, the only people that knew really was the headquarters because I brought my DD-214. So they knew through my interview process, what, who I was, but they were, they grilled me hard because they're like, what the fuck's the Navy SEAL doing here? Right. They don't want problems with the United States government. 
So there was a lot of that. I had a really heavy duty interview process. And uh, I mean, I remember sitting there with my sheet the first morning. I went in on the Hunter's Full Mood October 13th, 2019. And it was raining. I went in at night. It was just kind of quiet. And I was like, okay. So then that next morning when they blew the whistle and it kind of kicked off, and I'm stand, sitting with my sheet, right? Because I had been living my own life, doing whatever the fuck I wanted for two years, literally whatever I wanted. It was that moment where I went, fucking, am I really doing this right now? Like just having to do this. And it was, and that's when I just said, yeah, I am. And I started folding my sheet, man. But I gotta, I gotta even think and, and ask you about how freeing is that that they don't give a shit who you were. They don't care about that tailor from high school. They don't care about that guy that was in the seals. They don't care about that guy that got kicked out. They don't care about that guy in Hawaii. You are a whole new person. How freeing is that for them to not give a fuck who you were, but who you're going to be? Yeah, it was liberating. There was a liberating feeling of also just, Man, all I had to do now was focus on soldiering, right? That I had to just focus back on soldiering. And in a totally unique environment, speaking a new language, getting yelled at by Russian dudes speaking French, right? I got a lot of extra love, man. Let me tell you from the Russians speaking French, bro, when they found out who I was. So uh, it was a brutal situation, but I was like, I'm t- man, I've been through. I know I, I can handle this, man. I'm a tough motherfucker, right? So I was like, I got this, right? That was my self-talk at least, right? <laughs> Maybe it wasn't true, but I was like, man, I can do this, right? And it's like, that's what I had to tell myself to get through it. So I don't like that word tough, but you know, I, I was like, I, I, I can, <laughs> I was laughing with one of my buddies who's still operating at the tip, tip of the spear. He came to Paris and he met me. He was training with some of the French and uh, he came solo on a training thing and he met me and he goes, man, how was the, Seal, I mean, it's how was foreign legion selection and stuff coming in, like fucking going back to the you know bottom. And I said, man, through it, I was, I would have to dig deep. And I went, man, I've been through harder shit than this. And I go, or have I? <laughs> it was, like, or right. have I? Right. I had a lot of those moments where I'm like, man, this might be the worst thing I've ever done because it was my ignorance was gone. I had, I was not ignorant to what this process was going to be. It was going to be miserable. It was going, and I've already been doing halos. Now I'm doing shoot, move, and communicate with guys who haven't even been in the military before. Doing weapons handling. Like, lay down and here's how you shoot. Man. I had to strip away the ego like some people probably have, can never fucking imagine for months and months and months and get grilled and yelled at on runs and all this. It was, not to mention it's freezing. So you're freezing in the Spanish, in the French Pyrenees through the initial selection. It was brutal, man. You went to the Mountain Legion, correct? Well, yeah, but the I, I did. I went to, it's attached to the 27th Mountain Infantry Brigade, Brigade of France, the, uh, the mountain regiment that I went through. But before that, I came in in the winter, and our selection for Foreign Legion is out at a farm. Literally, it's called the farm, and it is a farm. You're like living on out at a farm in the winter in the French Pyrenees and it's fucking cold and they don't give you the clothes to deal with it. Right. Is it cause they just want to get rid of as many people as they can to see who's really there to do it. And, and on I, that same note, how many people leave while you're doing it? You know, they hack dudes on the interviews, mostly at the beginning. Really? Like they take, one out of 15 guys actually make it who come to the door. One out of 15 guys actually become legionnaires. And most of that's interview and medical, not quitting. So how do you think you passed the interview? You had so much stuff in your past that you had to explain and stuff because you said yeah. they don't want any trouble with the United States government. So what was so special about you that made you that one in 15? I know how to interview and I know how to talk to people. Right. And I, and I came confident, but I was also pretty honest. I didn't tell them everything, but I knew my background. They kept some hardcore motherfuckers show up there. This is a French foreign legion. This isn't a boy scout camp, right? You got guys coming from Eastern Bloc countries, Russia, all over 
faces and heads blasted in full tattoos, right? This is not your army boot camp, right? right. This is, these are some hardcore characters coming from gulags, some of them. So I knew well, my shit wasn't that bad, but they also don't have a Navy SEAL there every day. So I was getting grilled hard because they want, mostly they want to find out you are who you say you are. That's really what they need to know because there's a lot of countries with bad paperwork, right? Hard <laughs> to find out, who, right? Hard, bad documentation. So they at least knew who I was and they could go on Google and see I was this guy. And right. I had, some, they're like, Oh, he did say he got arrested for this. And okay. He did. So they're like, cause the known evils a lot better than the unknown evil. Right. Cause they don't want guys with sex crimes and shit like that. Right. So they need to know once they kind of find out you are who you say you are, that's better. And then they're still going to grill you about stuff. Right. And, and, and about just to kind of sh- rattle your cage. So that part was hardcore. They really wanted to know that I got kicked out for why I got kicked out. And I had. So, you know, I told them I got fucking kicked out for steroids. Right? <laughs> so they, they knew that was the deal. And they looked and I had been arrested for, you know, battery and fights and this and that. And that showed up. And so I was telling the truth for the most part. They can't dig up everything. Right. They mm-hmm. don't have access to every document. But they the big stuff they saw I was who I was. And so. And also I had ability, man. So I'm a, I'm coming in and I already know how to shoot. I already know how to do all that stuff. They know I do. So that's a benefit. They don't have to start from ground zero with somebody. And I have some leadership ability. They know kind of built in and I'm a little bit older. I was 34. So I was 34 going into this and they need that spectrum because you have 17 and a half to 39 and a half is the window at the foreign legion. And you have that full age spectrum and they pick, they pick guys from that full age spectrum. Would you compare that training? I know this is going to sound crazy, but I want to see if your thoughts the same. Almost being in prison again, the way oh, the, oh, the, the oh, medieval, yeah. the oh, barbaric, yeah. the hierarchy, is that how it is? Man, it's like that your whole contract it doesn't stop, right? That's the thing about the Foreign Legion, man. You are locked down, man. It is a thick, tense environment. Job satisfaction there is not high. And it is not like the American military. You got guys that are there because they have to be there. They can't go home for various reasons, or they won't go home because they're making $300 a month when they go home, right, in their militaries. So it is, if guys aren't happy to be there and they can't go home, guess what? They're going to take it out on you because you're American and they know your life's fucking chill. So it is a rough environment. I do not suggest that place for the faint of heart. So let me ask you then. So... How often are you having to, I guess, assert yourself? Let, let's put it in that form. How often no, are you having I didn't to assert have any, yourself? No, I didn't have any like physical altercations. Okay. Right, really. You know, I got in pretty good with some of the better guys right away. Right. It's just like anywhere else. Right. They show you show up. You're legit. The legit guys are going to link up with you. And then I was fine. Right. But there was that some tense moments at the beginning. Definitely when you're showing up to the regiment, when they're like, Because in the selection part, man, I know how to shut the fuck up and toe the line. That's one thing I know how to do. And that's what I did. I shut the fuck up and I kept my head down and I just kept powering through. I didn't care if they were yelling at me during the runs because they were because I was in the back. (laughs) And these those guys from Belarus can run, bro. (laughs) Let me tell you. And so those guys are machines of war, machine de guerre. Right. These machines. Some of these guys are good athletes, man. And so I was getting blasted on the runs, just yelling at me. You Navy SEAL can't run. I was like, hey, the footing is for the enemy. Running is for the enemy. That's what I would always tell them. They'd laugh. And they knew I just didn't give a fuck. Right? And so it was. I had to assert myself just by powering through. And then when I got to the regiment, I had to assert myself just by showing I wasn't going to kind of be pushed around. And then it was fine. Let's talk about the Wild West because I think a lot of people are confused. The French Foreign Legion is not special operations. I think a lot of people look at that. You've described them more to me as shock troopers. Um, well, they you, are. They're shock troopers. They're shock troops. Right? And it's more of a straight infantry. But the places that you were operating in, I, I, can we kind of compare them to what you were doing? And we don't need to get into mission specifics and stuff like that, but I mm-hmm. want to kind of compare it to your special operations career to what you were doing. And mainly we can talk about like when you're working Brazil, like on the border yeah. and stuff like that, the wild West being like that, comparing it to places mm-hmm. that you'd been with the U S 
is it different? Is it the same? Is war war? Or how are you looking at it? As my reality that I only can, uh, uh, can relate it to is as a Navy SEAL, a special operator in country, man, your autonomy level is high, right? So you, you, you're, yeah, you're deployed, but you, your schedule is pretty much yours, right? You have your, your watch time and then you have a lot more responsibility and autonomy and like, they don't care about your uniform and you know, you're, you're shirtless and right. That's all the foreign legion. They don't care where you are. The rules are the rules. We were in the rid middle of the jungle. Proper tenure. Dead serious. Every morning, waking up same time, in lines, the same process all the time, so just like we were in the regiment. The same stuff, the same formality with the officer, you know, coming out, saluting, all that stuff in the middle of the jungle. Dead serious. So, and the comfort level was much different, right? The United States, at least we had, you know, we were living in tents, but we had some air conditioning attached to it. Not the Foreign Legion, boy. <laughs> you are sleeping out in the wilderness with not a lot of gear, not a lot of money, right? No, the funding level is hugely different. So your calories are a lot lower. Your, your gear is a lot shittier and less, right? And so you're doing a lot less, and your, 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 your day is structured as shit, and the formality is tight, right? You're, you're there yelling at you and shit, even in the fucking jungle, I saw dudes getting extra military attention from some of the non-commissioned officers in the middle of the jungle. It's, it's uh tight. Is that because of the people that are coming in? Like you said, the guys that can't go back home or that, that are, you know, doing stuff like that. Is that formality and that rigidness? Is that because if they don't do that, that they could lose control out in the field? I think it's, you know, it's just the culture. It started that way, right, in the, in the 1800s, and so that they just never lost that, right? And then the guys who have come in and backfilled was, was Germans. And so it's, it's a geopolitical Petri dish. Of, it's an it's a example of what's going on geopolitically in the area. The Foreign Legion is interesting for that. Like, for example, Ukrainian war kicked off. Guess what? The, the French Foreign Legion used to be 10% Ukrainians. Now it's like zero. Right. Yeah. So it's like, that's, that's what I mean. Right. It's this morphic thing. So the culture just created that you have hardcore Eastern Bloc guys that bring that hardcore things. And those guys stay and those guys get promoted because they stay and th that whole culture gets pushed down. Right. And then you also have the formality from the French officers. So you have French officers coming from the academy that it's like a feather in their cap to be an officer in the French Foreign Legion. And so there's like a high and mighty side to that. You have to be extra, you know, respectful to the French officer. It's like that whole thing. And so there's like this well that is just created that it's like super pompous in some, in some ways of like the ornamentation of some of the formalities are way over the top. And then you have to be extra respectful with extra discipline. And then you have hardcore guys pushing that down. So it's like this, this interesting blend. That just creates this very unique environment. I want to talk kind of towards the end of your career. You, you have, and we'll talk about it at the end where people can find you, but you've done a lot of inspirational videos talking about the foreign legion. You've, you've talked about your career. You've talked about yourself in these videos. Did that ever cause trouble with the legion? Oh yeah, boy. So when I realized my foreign legion, I was pretty much done. I had my second deployment done. We went, to Estonia with the Enhanced Forward Presence Battle Group on the Russian border. And that was my last deployment with them, attached with the Danish and the English and the Estonians. Good deployment, but when I got back, I was done, right? I was pretty much done. So I'm kind of looking at, okay, what do I want to do after I knew? And throughout this process, I had started to be okay. Right. I started to realize that I had to look in because then I became when I became a legionnaire. Guess what? I realized I wasn't happy still. I went, oh, no. There's no more external places to reach or what title am I going to get? We talked before about, you know, I always wanted that title. Right. And that might come from that lack of. I need the Navy SEAL. I needed the 
Now I need the Legionnaire, right? Now, oh, fuck, there's nowhere else to go. What other title am I going to get that's internationally known and respected that I can do, really? And so that was like a kind of a scary moment. So in the barracks room, I looked around and I went, well, I guess I got to look internal. So that's when I started reading about stoicism. That's when I started looking into reading about reading Musashi, you know, the book of five rings, a samurai philosopher about all these principles that everyone's that all these great thinkers have known forever and what they teach. And I really started to build my daily discipline. And they, they foreign legion was telling me to get up at five. I would get up at three and I would work out in the bathroom. And I realized I was doing all this stuff every day, not missing, watching my macros, really getting crazy discipline. Oh shit, my life got better and I felt good. And then I started to realize I didn't need anything. I knew how to build this system and show and, and make myself okay, make myself good. I had lost my mojo. It took me years to get back in the Legion. I, it wasn't just immediate. I felt like I was walking through quicksand for like the first two, three years there. It was hard, man. And But when I looked internal and when I started building systems and doing these daily habits, disciplines, I felt good and I was happy every day. And I had peace and inter- alignment and clarity. And I wasn't going out and doing dumb shit in town and, and causing myself problems, looking for happiness in the same place I kept losing it before. And I felt good for a long extended period of time. And then I looked back and I hadn't had a bad day in like a year, ever. I haven't had a bad day. I can't even fucking remember, dead serious. Because I don't miss and I do all this stuff. And once I started to realize, I was like, I had to show people how to do this. I know how to do this, man. I felt low and now I feel great. So that's when I go, I'm ready. I was in the hospital. I tore my calf muscle in a, in a mountain thing. And so I was actually done. Like I tore my whole calf muscle. It's all deformed out in the mountains, up in the French Alps. And I, so I was done. I was going to be moving trucks for the next eight months. Of my, I had like eight months left. So I'm like, man, it's time. I, I have time. I'm in a hospital. I want to start speaking. And so I started, I, I want to teach people how to feel better. And I knew I'd be like, eh, I'm probably going to get no traction, right? <laughs> I'm not going to get any traction. It's going to take a while. So I started kind of just uploading picture on Instagram. It was scary to kind of get on social media. I hadn't had social media in a long time. I started uploading a picture one a day, one a day. Then I started practicing speaking in front of the camera, started practicing, I, assessing myself. And I did 85 days in a row, just speaking to myself, stream of consciousness, never uploaded anything. Then I read a book that said on 85, it takes 85 times to make something good. On the 86th day, I was in my barracks room. I pressed record and I recorded my first video the hard way about my life, my path. And I did it from my barracks room, stream of consciousness, no edits, no stopping. I never do any edits or stops on any of my videos and I never re- re-record. And that's how I, so I started uploading thinking nothing was going to come of it. And guess what? Got a ton of traction immediately. Started getting tens of thousands of views, hundreds of thousands of views, millions of views. And I was actually on vacation at the hospital again, getting my calf looked at when I get a call from like the NCIS of the Legion, the DPLE. And they go, you got to come here and you got to take all your stuff down now. And I had already, I had already been getting calls from people being like, you saved my life. I was going to kill myself till I saw your video. And I'm talking hundreds of emails, not like one or two hundreds. And I was like, I told them fucking, I'm not taking shit down. That's what I, I, I not and more respectful than that, obviously. And they were like, well, if you don't take it down, well, here's what this was happening. They went in my room, ransacked everything, lock, ripped everything out of my lockers, locked everything up. I was, I, I was going back to nothing. So then I had to get an attorney. <laughs> I fucking fought this thing from a distance with a doctor's note saying I needed to stay off the base. And it was a whole administrative battle. And they said, if you don't take it down, we're going to put give you back to back to back to back jail sentences until you take it down or we kick you out anyway. So I said, well, fuck that. And the lawyer goes, you have no legal rights here. They can lock you down and they were going to put me on food discipline, bread and water for four months. Get fucked. And so I was, so I fought attorney. My attorney said, you got to fucking get out of France, man. Dead serious. So when you look back on it, and this is kind of my final question for you, you needed a second chance, right? You go into the Legion, you figure out who you are. Finally, after all these years, 
You make this video, you find your new purpose in life. You're helping people discover who they are, discover that they don't want to kill themselves. And then the Legion tells you, take it down or we're kicking you out. Your attorney tells you to leave. You got the chance. And now you kind of have an asterisk by it. Do you think? Fucking nope. Okay. My Let's life is about great. It. My life is fucking great, man. I got a beautiful girlfriend. I'm crushing it, making a ton of money, coaching, doing what I like, living a life of my exact design. Man, I didn't go to the Legion to walk out pristine. It's not why I fucking went. I went to get right. I went to get experience. And I got exactly that. And guess what? Even stories of redemption aren't fucking fairy tales, man. This is life. This is real life. Shit happens. Guess what? People get married and things are beautiful and then things fall apart. Shit happens. Things change. And the smart man recognizes, reads the terrain, adapts, and pivots quickly. Man. If you want to be and go fucking die on a hill that's not worth fighting for, be my guest. I'm not going to go sit locked in a box to run out the fucking clock like an asshole. That's a fucking idiot would do that. And so you got to be smart, man. I went, my, my story of redemption is learning how to live right. Yep. And guess what? I get to show people how to do it. Not walking out of a gate with my fucking coat clean. Sure. It would have been nice. I would have loved that. And I tried, man. I fucking stayed in France. Even after they locked all my shit off for two months fighting that case, paying an attorney, I tried. There was no fighting a 200-year-old institution. I got news for you. Definitely not the Foreign Legion, where I'm not even a citizen. Mind you, these people are like, I'm not going to jail for a foreign government. It's not happening, right? I, my loyalty is not to France or the Legion. It's the United States. So people are like, you should have finished. Trust me, I get all the hate. Oh, you, got, you don't have it, uh, this guy trying to tell me how to live and can't fit. Bro, that's those same people who are sheep who would fucking go do what anybody tells them to do. I don't going to do that, man. I'm going to read realistically what's going on here. I tried. It's not working. Guess what? Not going to try to steer the river. I'm going to be smart about this and adapt. Well, that's the answer that I was hoping that you would give because – in all the time that we've talked, in every point of your career, in every point of your life, you were kind of hard-headed about it. And in this instant, you said, I know who I am, finally, and this is how yeah. it's going to happen. No other time in everything that we've talked about, your life, your careers, the, the SEALs, anything, you didn't do that. And you finally figured out who you are. And it's awesome to hear that answer from you, that you can step away from that and know exactly who you are, know exactly what it was worth, and know exactly where you're going. How good does that feel in your life to give that final answer? Man, I felt great, DJ. Just having that reality, I realized, man, I'm. if you're good anywhere, you can be good everywhere. I was so good and happy in the Legion at the regiment Man, when they told me, man, you, you're going to, we're going to do all that. I said, I, I don't want that, man. I'd like to finish up here strong there. You know, it was not happening. I was confident enough. I felt, you know what? I'm good, man. I'm good. I can get, I can get away that tile. I know who I am now. I know what I have to do to be correct every day and live correctly and make my mom proud of me, make my family proud of me about who I am now. Right. That's, that's what I realized was so important for so long that I couldn't do because I couldn't see it. That's exactly correct. So that, I felt great, man, when I walked out of there, and because that was my that was my redemption, man. It was, uh, it was, man. I feel good, man. I feel happy. I feel content. Feel fulfilled, and I know my purposeful path. And and that's what's so awesome to me because just 15 minutes ago when we talked about you got to a point in your career in the Legion where you were like, oh shit, there's no other title to go to. There's no other anything. And then you reach this point where you're like, I don't need a title. I am who I am. And it's awesome yeah. to hear that, man. I'm so happy for you that you've finally reached that level of mental maturity and that level of introspection that you have. And I want you to finish this up. I want you to tell people how they can become that kind of person, where they can start. We don't have to go through the entire process, but where they yeah. can start just making the little changes to change their life. First, decide who you want to be, not what you want to do, who you want to be. Then get up early. Think about that 10.0 man. Who is that guy? 
how does his family see him? How does he, how does he act? How is he respected? How does he conduct himself daily? Then think about that every morning at four o'clock in the morning, every morning, no days off for the rest of your fucking life. Then do that. Do what you need to do to make that man a reality. All right. Let's talk about where everyone can get more of you, find out where they can find you, social media, the websites, all of that kind of stuff where they can get coached, where they can learn how to turn this thing around. Man, if a guy has lost his mojo, if you're feeling like you're in quicksand, man, reach out to me. I promise you, I know how to do this. I will get you correct with just some simple steps. We strip it down to basics. Hit me up at taylorcavanaugh.com. On my contact form, goes directly to me. Nobody answers any of my stuff. I answer everything personally. So it goes directly to my email. Also, if you're on Instagram, TCAV official, DM me. Once again, it's always me. You're always only going to get me. And I'm Johnny on the spot with that. So I always try to be very quick in uh, response time if anybody reaches out to me on direct message. And if they want any of my long-form content, I do not only just – stream of consciousness videos, but I also do gym workouts and cool stuff and collaborations with a lot of cool guys and just cool stuff, man, fun stuff, positive stuff. And that's what, that's what, uh, can always drop a comment on me there at TCAP TV. All right, man. What's your final thoughts on this whole conversation that we've had tonight and live right. It's worth it. Not just for you, for your family, for the people in your life. And decide who you want to be, heal self, then work out, right? Be that beacon, be that pillar in your family. Man, that's where the true respect comes, right? All the rest of it's water. Start with self, then work out. Man, I'm so glad you came on here. Guys, you know where you can find Taylor. Let's talk about where you can find me. As always, you can find me on Instagram, the DTD underscore podcast. You can find me on Facebook at the DTD Podcast, and you can find me on YouTube where all these conversations, they're in video form. But your one stop, it's dtdpodcast.net. That's audio, video. Taylor's got his own episode page. He's got pictures. He's got ways that you can contact him. Anything you need to know about this episode and other episodes that we've had, go there to find it out. Make sure on the social medias that you share, you like, subscribe, be a friend, tell a friend, help us out. Let's talk about my sponsors real quick before we get out of here. Let's start with Mac belts. We all know that nothing stands up to wear and tear like a leather belt. If you're looking for the toughest leather belt on earth, then you've come to the right place. Mac belts. They're handcrafted in the USA by my buddy Mac Alexander, a retired Navy SEAL. And if you're looking for a belt that's tough enough for your active lifestyle and helps support those who've given so much to our country, look no further than Mac belts. It's the toughest belt on the earth. MacBelts.com. Mac belts are the highest caliber of American craftsmanship, and you will not be sorry when you go there. Make sure you go check them out. Let's talk about coffee. Police Coffee is an officer owned business, and it's dedicated to crafting the finest coffees and blends, and they're shipped as soon as they're made to provide you with the freshest coffee available. Each batch is roasted fresh by people who know what it means to stay vigilant, and their specialty coffees do not miss one drop when it comes to flavor. But the most important cause, they give back to my community. 50% of their profits go towards helping family members of police officers who fell in the line of duty. And make sure you check out their flavors. One Ranger, my favorite. Medium bodied, smooth and sweet pecan flavor. It's probably the best combination in the world. It's rich, sweet, nutty, and buttery. And it cuts right through coffee's natural acidity to give you the most smooth and satisfying coffee experience that you can think of. K-Cups, whole bean, ground, dog treats, coffee cups anything you need to drink coffee you got it there make sure you go check out my sponsors macbelts.com policecoffee.com and at policecoffee.com djk10 will get you 10 percent off your order guys that's going to be it for this week i'm so happy that my guest came back to tell his entire story because i think it needs to get out there more make sure you check him out make sure you check us out share like and subscribe that's taylor i'm dj we'll catch you on the next one see you later